My name is Nancy Hatch Dupree, and I'm working with the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University, which is a collection of documents related to Afghanistan. Anyone who has been to Afghanistan in the past half century knows the name Nancy Hatch Dupree. Nancy lived a colorful and fascinating life in Afghanistan, first as the wife of a CIA agent and then the wife of a renowned Harvard-educated archaeologist, Louis Dupree, with whom she spent many years traveling to archaeological sites around the country in the 1960s and 70s, writing articles and guidebooks and socializing with Kabul elites. Nancy then lost nearly everything she loved when she and Louis were kicked out of Afghanistan in 1978 and he died in 1989. She then spent the next three decades fighting to protect the country's rich heritage, which was devastated by war, until she passed away in 2017. I'm Ava Meharry, and in this podcast for the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University and the Afghanistan Society, I will take you through the extraordinary life of Nancy Hatch Dupree, my late mentor, by talking to some of the people who knew her best about her adventures, love, loss, and devotion to Afghan heritage. Nancy was born in New York in 1927, and then spent her earliest years in India while her father worked in agriculture for the State Department, where she learned to ride horses with the Maharaja's brother before they moved to Mexico. She would later say that she felt like she grew up on a stage set, and her later years would prove just the same. Nancy returned to New York to study art at Barnard College and then Chinese art and culture during a master's at Columbia University, where she met and fell in love with fellow student Alan Wolf. After they were married, they traveled to Iraq, Pakistan, and then Afghanistan in 1962 for Alan's job with the CIA. She was married to Alan Wolf, the CIA great, and she went to Afghanistan as his wife. Here's Sandra Cook, the former co-chair of the Louis and Nancy Dupree Foundation, who explained how when Nancy arrived in Kabul, she didn't want to spend her time idly playing bridge with the other diplomatic wives. And so she wrote this book, the ATO, the Afghan Tourist organization. They were going to take this group of important visitors to Mamiyan. So they asked her if she would write a book about it or a guide. And she said, I will. And characteristic of Nancy, she does incredible research. So uh, she did all this research and she wrote this book. And somebody said to her, before you actually get that published for the visitors, you should take it to this guy. He's a professor. He's doing anthropology technological work here in Afghanistan and have him look at it and just make sure it's okay. And she thought, well, that's a good thing. I want to make sure it's factually correct. So she took it to Louis and he, he handed it back across the table to her and he said, well, there's nothing really original here. And she said, well, I'm not writing a PhD thesis. This is a tourist guide. And she stomped out of the room. And as she tells it, he said, wait a minute come back here. Well, they fell in love. They had this mad affair. I next spoke to the archaeologist Charles Kolb, who said he didn't know about the affair when he met Louis and his wife Anne and Nancy and her husband in Kabul. Now, by the time I met everybody in 1965, this was a foursome. They were always together doing things when they were in Kabul, going to parties, going to embassy functions, and what, uh, what was transpiring, I only found out about later. Louie and I went to northern Afghanistan. We were some of the first Americans allowed up there on permit because it was within the Soviet jurisdiction. The south of Afghanistan was in American jurisdiction. So the Soviets built an airport for the Afghans in Zari Sharif, and the Americans countered by building the Kandahar Airport in the south of Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And so it was that kind of uh, play. Again, it's part of the great game, actually, of uh, the British Raj and the uh, Russian Empire. At any rate, uh, what was happening that I didn't know about is that Louis and uh, Nancy began extramarital affairs. And of course, Louis and I are up there in, in uh, northern uh, Afghanistan on the Balk River south of Mazari sharif were pretty well isolated. We had started to run out of supplies, so we needed to uh, send somebody back, and that was Louie. He went back to, uh, uh, to Kabul. And uh, it was supposed to be a quick trip 
to get money out of the bank uh, and uh, get supplies and get the alcohol that was already there at the Dupree's house and bring it up to uh, the area of the town of Acapruk, uh on the Balk River. And so uh, he's gone. He's supposed to be going down, coming back. A week, tops. It turns out that he was gone for three weeks. But what I did not know at the time is that the uh, Dupree's and the Wolves had decided to be divorced. And that's what would happen in January of the next year, uh, 1966. Ultimately, Nancy and Louie got married in early February, February 6th. And Anne and Alan got married just after they did. So it was basically two families switching houses and switching one another because Annie was more interested in the diplomatic side and the State Department side of uh, life, going to parties and doing all these kinds of things. Whereas Nancy and Louie were interested in the history and culture of Afghanistan. And that was the separating thing. Louis and Nancy Dupree then became the it couple of Kabul. Here's Whitney Azoy, the anthropologist and former diplomat, who talks about his time at the Dupree's notorious five o'clock follies after work drinks which were held at their home in Kabul in the 1960s and 70s. It was an exciting time to be in Afghanistan. Visitors were flocking there along the so-called hippie trail, archaeological exploration was flourishing, and political ideas were being hotly debated amidst the Cold War, especially in 1973 when King Zahir Shah was overthrown in a bloodless coup by his cousin and former Prime Minister Daoud, who formed a republic. He had this five o'clock follies, he and Nancy did later on, whereby anybody could come. It was the only open bar in Kabul. Anybody could come and anybody did including the Afghans, including the Afghan government officials. And he'd go there and there'd be this bar, you know? And uh, when I first came to Kabul, I was a diplomat, so it was easy to get a drink. But for a lot of people, it wasn't. And you'd go there and you'd get a drink and you'd get another drink and you'd start talking. Everybody would start talking. It was terrific. God, there'd be all these girls, you know? And, and uh, they had a great time. And, Louis and Nancy would keep serving this stuff and listening. And they closed the show and they, they'd sit down and write what they heard. And they'd refine those notes in the morning. And then five o'clock in the afternoon began all over again. I don't think anyone, no one since my first time there in the early 1970s, I don't think that anyone ever had the social reach of Louis and Nancy Dupree in Afghanistan. They knew the king. They knew. They knew Daoud. They they knew members of the uh, of the communist underground, which wasn't very communist and wasn't very underground. But they they knew they knew all sorts. Of well, you know, it was its transition here, because I would have seen them on both ends of the transition from the kingdom to the to Daoud's republic. Here's Marvin Weinbaum, scholar in residence at the Middle East Institute. And I, I thought that the, the Friday meetings was really an effort to bring together the Afghan intellectuals with the foreign community. Now, one wasn't a lot of people there, perhaps uh, at any one point in time, I, I don't know, 15, 20 at the very most. But I got to meet Afghans who I would never otherwise meet, who were all friends of Louis. He was publishing up a storm. In those days, he was writing for the American University field staff, which he was a member of, and they stationed people all around. And so Nancy and, and Louis, although Louis was the person of name, they were the people there for Afghanistan and Pakistan. They were living in Kabul. And that, that lasted until the communists came and then threw Louis into prison for a little while. Ten years ago, I interviewed Nancy, where she talked about their transition to Pakistan after President Daoud's republic was overthrown by the communists in 1978, and the Soviets then invaded Afghanistan in 1979. She stayed in Pakistan to work with the thousands of refugees fleeing the violent fighting between the communist forces and Mujahideen resistance forces, while Louis traveled back and forth across the border with the Mujahideen. 
during the Tariki regime, we were thrown out. My husband was put in jail. Uh, but um, then we were living in Peshawar. He was coming back with the Mujahideen. I didn't come with the Mujahideen. I thought it was not fair because, again, the Afghan character, you know, the respect to the old lady and think if there was a helicopter coming, he would, he would stay in order to help me. And that was endangering his life. I had no right to do that. So my husband, he was like a goat. He would go with the Mujahideen. They could find shelter. So he was covering the Mujahideen. I was covering the growth of the refugees in Peshawar. I spoke to the author, Ahmed Rashid, about Nancy's time during the 1980s in Pakistan and the political situation there, including the Arab fighters who came to join the Mujahideen resistance against the Soviets, most notably the future leader of al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. Nancy was very much a fixture in Peshawar and was immensely popular amongst everyone. The Afghans, the foreign expats. Remember, at that time, it was all the aid that was going into the Afghan people was going in through Peshawar. So all the aid agencies were there, the UN was there, and then every uh, major country in, in the West wanted reports from how the war was going against the Soviets and all. So all the diplomats were there. It was also very dangerous because people were being assassinated in Peshawar. And then, of course, you know, by, the, by 1986, the Arabs had arrived in force, they weren't particularly threatening at that time, but it was very interesting to try and find out what they were up to. And it was very difficult to meet the Arabs, particularly, obviously, Bin Laden, who was there. But they, they came to start, they came to play a very dominant role in, in the politics of Bashar. So, you know, Nancy was basically, I mean, collecting and archiving all the material that she had collected over the years in, in uh, Kabul. And, uh, of course, all this was to re-emerge later on when, the, uh, when she, she moved her whole archive to Kabul University. So she went to Afghanistan with Ellen Wolf. She married Louis. They were there until the Russians invaded. They fled to uh, Pakistan. And they were there for a long time. And then they came back to the United States. And he took up a professorship at Duke University. And then he died. And finally, after some time, friends of hers urged her to go back to Bashar because she was just grieving and in no man's land, to go back to Bashar and pick up on some of the work that Louis had started, that Louis and she had started in collecting materials about Afghanistan. This is the archive that eventually became ACKU. She was kind of in the background. And it's not until after Louis' death, I think, that she really steps out from what I could see on her own. Well, what choice did she have? But she certainly wanted to carry on his legacy in every conceivable way. But her really genuine love for the Afghans was just always evident. And as we know, she dedicated the those years, and we're talking about 30 years, that she outlived Louis. And, and I think that's the most interesting part of her story. After Nancy returned to Pakistan in the wake of Louis' death in 1989, she continued to build her archival collection. But in 1992, her attention turned to the preservation of the National Museum of Afghanistan in Kabul, which she knew particularly well from writing a guidebook for it in 1974. After the Soviets had withdrawn from Afghanistan in 1989, the Afghan communist government had held on to power for several more years against the Mujahideen resistance fighters, until 1992 when the government collapsed. The Mujahideen factions then broke out into civil war and the museum ended up on the front line of the fighting during the early 1990s. At the time, Ahmed Rashid reported on the condition of the museum. It was a very desperate situation in Afghanistan. I mean, at that time, the civil war had been going on. There had been fighting literally outside the Kabul Museum. Uh, there had been destruction by 
both the Taliban and Dostum's forces, uh, the Uzbek forces. And uh, there were real fears that, you know, the, the whole museum would be looted, robbed or destroyed. The local Afghan staff played an incredible role, along with the UN, to try and negotiate their independence from the fighting and not to be held hostage by anyone, and also to preserve what was uh, there already. I sat down with the former director of the National Museum of Afghanistan, Omar Khan Masoudi, to talk about efforts to protect the museum during the Civil War. We met at the Serena Hotel, formerly known as the Kabul Hotel, where Mr. Masoudi had helped store artifacts from the museum for safekeeping during the conflict. His colleague translated for him. So when they got the permission to visit the National Museum, so there were some journalists at that time with them and the ICRC representatives. So they visited, and uh, but they found the, uh, the National Museum in a very bad situation at that time, especially the upper floor was uh, totally burned, and uh, the depot or the storages that, uh, that they used to keep the, uh, the artifacts there, their doors were broken, and uh, most of the artifacts were looted. So there were some limited uh, number of artifacts that they were burned, but uh, they have lost most of the documentaries, uh, inventory cards for the artifacts, which was on the second floor, and they were burned at that time. So uh, after two days, Nancy, in a very harsh winter, came to Kabul and visited the National Museum staffs and they were like trying to protect the remaining artifacts that, you know, from demolition and from destructions. After two days uh, work and consultation, so they were trying to establish a society for the preservation of Afghan cultural heritage, especially the National Museum aspects. So everyone knew at that time that it was a very great risk actually going to the west of Kabul at that time, especially during the war. But Nancy, because the the love that uh, she had for the Afghan culture and the interest that she had, she was coming to Kabul at the time that there were no hotels, no accommodations, especially the whole city was under the war. But uh, she had the interest for the culture especially for the artifacts of the National Museum, to preserve them. I spoke to Jolien Leslie, who worked for the UN in Kabul at the time and was a founding member of SPACH, the Society for the Preservation of Afghanistan's Cultural Heritage, about Nancy's role in the organization. We had this kind of brainwave to, together with Carla Grisman, we, we decided to set up an organization uh, and it was a kind of slightly Janus faced one uh, organization because on the one hand we had to speak to uh, impressionable diplomats in Islamabad particularly where the power was because everybody was offshore and those of us in the field who were actually much more viscerally involved and, and much more operationally involved had to somehow reconcile the kind of diplomatic side. The government had fallen, uh, there was nothing very much to replace it. So it filled a gap because there was, there was, it wasn't Afghans speaking for themselves necessarily, although there were, I think we all made an effort to try and make sure there was an Afghan voice, so it just wasn't an ex expat um, coterie. And as a result of the war and the lack of control over the country, particularly key sites like Herat and Jam and others, and to some extent Balkh, the lid was a little bit off the pot. Um, it didn't always happen, but quite often the Mujahideen then plundered. Um, the, many of these sites have been plundered before anyway, but, but it was particularly intrusive and destructive until, well, for, for you know, more or less a decade, actually, um, that, that it was kind of open season. I mean, Nancy being in Peshawar actually had a very privileged position because she was able to see, first of all, she had a very good network, but she was also able to see objects passing through which was much easier to see in Peshawar because the dealers were more concentrated there. And I think she probably had a very good network of Afghans who went and scouted out pieces. So there was both a political vacuum but also a technical vacuum. And Spatch tried to fill the latter by actually going out, visiting places, trying to raise awareness about issues and, 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 and flag wave about being essentially also like a fire alarm to say we need to be careful, we need to be careful. So I think there was a practical side of it. 
and then it then it evolved because we had a you know as it were a sovereign counterpart and did some more practical work more implementation focused on the museum and i think a lot of the key players who had been heavyweight diplomats in kabul had had moved on as individuals and they you know they were passionate in their different ways and that that gave us a lot more impetus thanks to nancy's extraordinary skills of wooing ambassadors and getting them engaged so that was nancy's main role then was it working with the ambassadors and and getting getting support for it yeah and and actually drawing on 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 in a very direct way as nancy always was you know talking facts uh, and basically saying i remember because i went there with louis in the 1960s and that was very very useful because i would always defer to her and say well yes i've been to that site but i was only there 5 minutes ago or you know 3 months ago um what's the you know what's the deeper story and she was very very useful at sort of digging that up in 1994 the taliban movement emerged which was based on a strict interpretation of islamic law to challenge the warring mujahideen factions and restore order to the country based on their religious views After the Taliban captured the capital in 1996, they continued to fight the Mujahideen forces in the Bamian region in central Afghanistan. There, a Taliban commander threatened to destroy the famed Bamian Buddhas in 1997 and carried out an attack the following year, damaging the small Buddha statue, despite reassurances from the Taliban leadership that the statues would be protected. Here's the journalist Kathy Gannon about Nancy's efforts to find out about the condition of the Buddha statues in Afghanistan. The Kabul airport was closed, and we had to fly into Ghazni. and they took a bus uh it was the Taliban time and we took a bus up to um Kabul and uh so it was Nancy and I in front of the in the front of the bus and despite the fact that everybody said no you can't sit at the front of the bus well Nancy and I looked at each other and said of course we're going to sit at the front of the bus and Nancy was coming and and had been coming but she was she was trying to get to Bamiyan This was long before the Buddhas. I I want to say 99 because it, it there there was no issue with traveling to see the Buddhas and there's no issue with uh, uh she also went to Ghazni there was a, a a sleeping Buddha there that uh, the Italians I think had done some help restoring and she spent I think maybe is two, two three weeks there then I was then in charge of the UN in Kabul and we had a kind of a brainstorming about how to deal with um the the looming issue of the Bamiyan Buddhas because it was kind of on on the on the radar. And she was very very useful in terms of kind of guiding me about sitting down and saying the UN needs to be careful not to politicize this. Um the international community risks actually drawing too much attention to the risks to give as it were a trump card. to uh the you know the hardline uh, factions um so they might turn around and say you know as 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 a demonstration of their power this is what we're going to do and that was quite helpful because it was something that was in my mind's eye but to have her huge historical perspective despite protests by spots in the international community in march 2001 the taliban destroyed the bombing and buddha statues and other pre-islamic statues across the country including at the national museum Two decades of conflict had devastated the country and its cultural heritage. Following the overthrow of the Taliban in late 2001 by NATO-led forces in response to September 11th, as the international community began to support nation building in Afghanistan, Nancy was keenly aware of the many challenges facing the preservation of the country's heritage. In an interview with Julian Leslie shortly before she passed away, Nancy reflected on some of these issues in the post-2001 era. History has been taught so badly, dates and and paper, you no know, illustrations, bad paper, you know, n- not a, a textbook that you want to pick up. And then when they went into as refugees in Iran, they got Iranian history and they got Arab history, no Afghan. And in Pakistan, they got Pakistani and Arab. no act so they came back here and they had no sense of belonging and now kabul is a jazzy place and for a while they were quite happy to be back because it was uh, you know a lot going on but that it became rather ephemeral and they 
felt that they didn't belong here. And so many of the young people are trying desperately to get out of here, which is a loss to the work. And um, they say it's because there are no jobs, which is unfortunately true, and also the security is so bad. But I, it's more than that. They just don't have a sense of belonging. They don't know their past. They don't know their history. They don't know what their heritage. They don't know how rich their, their history is. They have not, not a single clue. Nancy was never short of ideas about how to tackle the many challenges facing Afghanistan's heritage and education of the younger generation. Here's Laura Tedesco, U.S. cultural attache, on one of these ideas. I remember asking Nancy for just like, give us your ideas. What would be some useful things to do in the cultural preservation sector? As this, and this was concurrent with the security situation really starting to decline, like 2013, 2014, 2015. And Nancy had the brilliant idea of creating a kind of museum on wheels and somehow creating a curriculum around what's in the National Museum about Afghanistan's much more diverse heritage than is taught officially in school curriculums and introducing young students like middle school and high school age students to some topics that they may not have been exposed to. We have a number of grants that we've been doing, but one of the most significant ones is, um, is something called the Mobile Museum Outreach Project. Here's Gil Stein, archeologist from the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And it turns out that Nancy was the animating force behind this. I'll, I'll say the irresistible animating force behind that. This that she single-handedly persuaded the State Department to fund a project where the whole idea was to educate Afghan high school students about the cultural heritage of Afghanistan and especially to bring the National Museum out to the people because it's it's a, you know, obviously it's a free museum for Afghans and uh, it is the treasure house of basically the most important objects that encapsulate or tell the story of the development of civilizations in Afghanistan is in that museum. And it's incredibly important stuff that most people in the world don't even know about. But a big part of the problem is that Afghan can't even get to the museum. If you're outside of Kabul and you're a high school student, it's not like some kid in America being able to do a, a school trip to visit the Smithsonian. And so what we did was we made 3D replicas of artifacts from the museum, and then we developed an in-school program with Afghan instructors. And we, we reached something like um, 90 schools, basically the entire Kabul school district. We did programs in every school. And then we went out to um, all the major cities in Afghanistan, and they loved it. And by all accounts, it's been quite well received. You know, it's interactive. There's these 3D replicas of artifacts that students get to handle and feel the texture of. They're not actual artifacts. They're just uh, facsimiles. But, you know, when you can handle something and hold something and feel the size of it in your hand and the texture of it, it's, it brings something to life in a way, in a kind of pedagogical way that's not typical for the typical Afghan pedagogy, which is um, much less interactive. So I would say that it was based on Nancy's idea that it was one of the most successful cultural preservation projects that the U.S. Embassy ever supported. And it wasn't millions of dollars. It, it began as a modest idea, which is so classic for Nancy. I mean, she was able to get to the heart of issues so efficiently. So it started as a very modest idea, and the impact was, I think, quite powerful. Preservation of information. Now, this is very important because um, it's not very well developed here. And that's one of the reasons for ACKU, my center, 
I'm collecting the things that everybody is uh, working, all the research that's being done now. Because usually what happens with these uh, big agencies, they bring a reporter or a consultant, pay them big money, and they write a report, and they circulate it for a short time, and then it disappears. We collect, or try to collect, all the reporting that's being generated by the NGOs, by the bilateral governments, by the UN agencies, anything that uh, describes what is going on, what is the situation here in Afghanistan. And the reason we do this is because I am convinced that if you give the people of Afghanistan access to the information they need, that they themselves will do 80% of all this very expensive development. I've come to the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University, ACKU, to talk to the director, Wahid Wafa, who's carrying on Nancy's work. So we're here during COVID, but I've been here in the past where this place is absolutely buzzing. Can you just talk a little bit about what people come here to do? You know, to be honest, still uh, this center uh, is a place that uh, every second that we are talking, somebody is in it that we don't know. I mean, currently we see around 250,000 people are going to all these uh, platforms that we have. But during uh, the summer, uh, you see hundreds of students all around. And uh, she was right when she, when she and I were um, fundraising for the remaining part of this building, she was telling uh, a donor, I can remember, that, look, one day I will invite you to a beautiful place that will f have a flow of young, bright, and beautiful people there. And you can't find a space. And that was true. I mean, when we uh, uh, launched this building, the next day, hundreds of uh, students were around us. I mean, still, if you come to during the summer, spring, despite this COVID, despite all these violence in this country, so this iconic building is a place for pictures outside, you know. Hundreds of students are outside while dozens are inside working. But her legacy is uh, getting very strong by this digitization project that People are visiting the center online every day. After speaking to Wahid, I've come to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kabul to interview former President of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, who I've been told formed a close friendship with Nancy. I've read that you were quite involved in, in ACKU and helping her and inviting her to bring her documents back and also you yes. helped with funding to find yes. the building. Yes. Would you like to tell us a bit about why you from, felt from, like involved? From childhood, from childhood, especially from my teenage years, in the regular household talks, I used to hear the elders of the family, my uncles and others who were at the university at the time or who were at the foreign service at the time, talk about her, about Louis Dupree and Nancy Dupree and what they were doing. Of course, as teenagers, you just hear without much curiosity into things. So there was that familiarity uh, uh, about the couple who worked in Afghanistan and who did a lot on Afghan archaeology and uh, the riches of our uh, museums and all that. That familiarity was there, and then also while we were in the in the resistance in Peshawar, um, I did very often come across uh, her work, uh, and that that she was busy there and that she was working. This is after her husband passed away as well. Uh, she 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 remained lovingly committed to Afghanistan. 
and the good causes of our, of our, of our heritage and of our Archaeological sites or our national monuments. Uh, so when I, when I, when I, uh, when we all arrived in Afghanistan, when I became the head of the government during my my time in office, one of the most pleasant experiences of my time in office was uh, getting together with her and talking about things and listening to her mm. to tell her th uh, us things. And when she came up with the idea of the resource center at the Cobb University, I was so happy. And at the stroke of a second, I said, right, we will, we'll find you the funds. And, and we did that. And she built a good site there, a nice building, quite good. So it was, uh, it was uh, in many, many, many ways, in, in very profound ways, I should say, in very profound ways, uh, a tremendous honor. Uh, to have uh, to have known her, to have worked with her, to have uh, been in a very 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 minutely small way part of her uh, endeavors for Afghanistan. So it's, 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 and I'm glad talking to you about all this and, and this grand lady of the country. I am. Um, it's interesting you bring up hearing about her. So many people that I've spoken to. Always want to tell stories about Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, Nancy was so a, many have, so many people have yeah. stories about Nancy. Yes, well, yes exactly. So Nancy, was, Nancy was a great storyteller. Yes, and uh, yes. yeah, she lived a very colorful life. Do you have any particular story with Nancy that, that you like to tell? Her? Well, lots of stories. She treated us like youngsters. <laughs> that was great. She would come into the office and sit down, tell me, and do this, and do this, and why haven't you done this? You've not been a good boy. Well, that was great. That was very, very nice. Do you think that helped make her effective at what she, I mean, she accomplished quite very, a lot. Very, very, and she accomplished a lot. Look at the dedication that she, that she had for our country, and for, 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 for culture, for, not only for culture and uh, uh, the relics of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but also for the future generations. Mm -hmm. uh, when during the Taliban, when the schools were closed, she she opened up, uh, you know, sort of libraries mm -hmm. and uh, material uh, for for children and for the education of children. So. Um, uh, it was, uh, she, she, she did all she could with, 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 with all the endeavors that a human being can, 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 can afford to keep us a living cultural society. President Karzai was far from the only political figure Nancy persuaded to support her causes. Here's Sandra Cook again, talking about Nancy's talent for swaying people. We wanted to raise some money in the United States. The Dupree Foundation was specifically formed to raise money in the United States, and we had a 501c3, so anybody who donated could take a tax deduction. So we set up this thing for her on Capitol Hill, and it could have been in the Senate building, but somebody set up Richard Holbrook to come to this affair, and there were really important people there. I mean, he was just one of all these people who came to hear her, hear her talk. People from the army and all the services, people from Capitol Hill, senators, et cetera. So she gave her talk and there she is, this little bird, you know, giving her talk. And she said, and she talked about ACKU and she said, so we did this, we collected this archive. And then she said, but that was what, not enough. We wanted to do more for the Afghan people. So we started writing these books and she talked about the ABLE program and she said, but even that was not enough and everything. So she gave this endearing little talk. And after she spoke, Richard Holbrook, he walked up to the podium and he said, we have got to do something here. And we managed to raise $2 million from USAID through his influence. What would you say Nancy's legacy is in Afghanistan? How do you want people to remember her? Well, she's remembered very fondly. She's remembered lovingly, lovingly. 
by those who are aware of her work, uh, generally. But, but the educated lot of the country and those who have lived at that time all know her, mm. without exception, without exception. So she is a household name in the country, very, very much. And one that we, we don't consider her anymore uh, an American. Uh, we consider her an Afghan and we are proud of uh, her being from the soil and we treat her as one of our greatest. Well, uh, as far as, you know, educated Afghans are concerned, I mean, she will never be forgotten. Here's Ahmed Rashid again. Because she uh, restored their dignity, their history, uh, their, their, their pride in their own country and their people by, you know, keeping such voluminous archives, which are now available in, in, the, in Kabul University. The problem now is that, remember, Kabul University was a, a shooting ground um, at the time of the Civil War, and uh, it, it could become once again, because uh, Kabul University was, a, the Taliban considered it a major threat to their, because it pr produced educated people um, who were specialists, etc. And um, it, we could see again fighting around the Kabul University and uh, the looting of, of various things in, in, in Kabul. And of course, now there's uh, an American Afghan university in Kabul also, which has been attacked. And um, we've seen professors being kidnapped from there. We've seen people being killed there. So it, it's, it's not that much has changed. The disrespect that the Taliban had for education in the 90s is once again being uh, repeated. And really, I mean, Nancy's legacy is giving the Afghans a, a sense of their own history and pride. And she was dealing with not just the old, uh, the archaeological remains uh, that were so historic, so many civilizations that passed through Kabul and Afghanistan, but uh, how that would create uh, modern Afghans who were part of the, the global community. Here's Ambassador Newman, one of the Ambies, as Nancy used to like to call ambassadors, who served in Afghanistan from 2005 to 2007. Uh, you have this, uh, these targeted assassinations now at the whole intellectual strata of Afghanistan. And, and so I think the first and foremost need, of course, will be for Afghan women to be the lead, the exemplars. But somebody like Nancy, who believed in Afghanistan and believed in women, I, I think is uh, at least the kind of example that's still awfully, awfully useful today. She was, and I hope still will be, such a beacon to Afghan women of what women can achieve in Afghanistan. And you have, as I'm sure you know from being there, an incredible number of really dynamic, impressive women. Here's Kathy Gannon again. I think for Nancy, Afghanistan was both a love letter to Louis. It was a, a continuation of um, her uh, passion for Louis, but it was also her real passion for Afghanistan and for the next generation, for each next generation. I mean, this wasn't something that she just uh, uh, most recently would say, um, even I remember in the 90s and, and, and in the early 2000s, the new generation just doesn't know. They don't know their heritage. They don't know their, um, the real depth of, of their culture. And, and, uh, and for her, this was um, it, it, one of the most important reasons for what she did was trying to educate and preserve for each successive generation the real treasures that that was there in Afghanistan and that were theirs to to take pride in and, and I remember her saying that in one of our last conversations is I want to finish this because I want them to take pride in this this is where you know that the, their their pride should should stem from and and she was really very passionate about it and I know the center is is such a a gift of Nancy's to Afghanistan and to successive uh, generations. So yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty remarkable. 
On my last morning in Kabul, I went with Wahid Wafa to Baghi Bala to visit Louise and Nancy's memorial. The palace was a fitting resting place. Built by the Afghan emir in the 1890s, it had been home to the Royal Cabinet of Curiosities that would one day form the National Museum, before the palace was transformed into a high-end restaurant where Louis and Nancy were married. This is uh, actually a, a, a stone that, uh, and a place that Nancy brought the ashes of Louis, but it was very secret. Few people knew about it. Yeah. I'm a little bit also scared of the security of this stone, although it's just a stone. But when, when Nancy died, we put her name also beside Louis Dupree. Mm. You know, this side, it's the Farsi, yeah. and it says that Khatri Dus Dashtani. So, in the other side is the English, in loving memory, Nancy Hatch Dupree, 1927-2017, and Louis Dupree, 1925-1989. So, it was done by Nancy herself. Why did Nancy decide to put him here? Because I think, because they married here in this palace, this small restaurant, mm -hmm. and she loved the place and the view, and probably Louis Dupree also loved the place. So. Mm -hmm. And because, and Louis Dupree and Nancy both loved the kind of flower that you can find around here. So I don't know the name in English, but mm -hmm. it's Argawan. And, and most probably the time that Nancy put this stone here, so these trees were smaller, and you yeah. could see everywhere from here. And as I told you, she was saying, hey, Luis has got a beautiful view. <laughs> and it is, and it's an amazing view of this part is. of the city, isn't it? Yeah, you can see uh, most part of the city from mm -hmm. here, you know, the north part, and also the east part of the city. And with the snow-covered mountaintops in the background. Yeah. I think she's she's happy with that. Out of this, we must see some leadership. We must look to to the to the young people, find a direction, find a leader to lead us in that direction. 